Yes, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to present our project to you. So I will try to share the screen. So hopefully you can see the presentation. And see, very good, thank you. That's okay, okay. Yeah, so I would like to present our international project uh, with the acronym ZARA, Surveillance of Emerging Pathogens and Antibiotic Resistances in Aquatic Ecosystems. I have prepared this uh, presentation together with my colleague, Claudia Stange, and the colleagues in the project. And I yeah, will share some results and give you a general overview. Of course, our project is still running, so we are working on our data and papers on preparation, but it's a pleasure to show you some results. The key objectives of our projects are listed here. So we started our project uh, during the corona pandemic when we had many restrictions. So one of our objectives was to check the suitability of SARS-CoV-2 detection in wastewater as an early warning tool. Um, I will show you some data. Then we did method harmonization for the cultivation methods for indicators on antimicrobial resistance and nucleate ASIC extractions in order to be sure, to make sure that we really can compare our data yeah, so that we use harmonized methods. And then we focused on a better understanding of the occurrence of fate of enteric viruses, antibiotic resistances, and microbial source tracking markers in the aquatic environment. We had a look at the role of sediment and bivalves and the integral monitoring element and as reservoirs for the pathogens. And we had uh, sampling during extreme weather events. Uh, I will show you some data. We are still working on summarizing everything to do a risk assessment and to develop monitoring recommendations. And of course, we work on the papers to be published. The structure of the project is also shown here. So we have the different work packages focusing on different types of pathogens. And I will follow this order and present you the concept and the data. Um, our consortium is uh, consisting of eight partners representing different climate areas. I start in the north. So we have partners from Sweden, then our group in Germany, a group in France, in Spain and Portugal. We have a partner from Israel who is also attending the presentation today. We have two partners from Africa, Uganda, more on the central part of Africa and Mozambique more in the south of Africa. And so we can compare the surveillance data from different climate zones and under different conditions. So this is a general idea. And because we have so many different partners, it was very important to harmonize the methods in the beginning to really can compare our results. Um, our sampling points are illustrated here. So we have taken a lot of samples from surface water, different rivers, from wastewater treatment plants, influent, effluent. We have taken some samples from hospital wastewater. We also looked at sediments and bivalves. Um, our parameters are listed here. So E. coli as a general fecal indicator. Then we looked at ESBL bacteria, antibiotic resistance bacteria, a method very oft, uh, often used for cultivation. We looked at the antibiotic resistant genes, then at the viruses, indicator viruses, somatic and F-specific coliphages, also crestphage as a human marker, and as pathogenic viruses, such as coronavirus, adenovirus, norovirus, hepatitis, and enterovirus. We are interested to understand <clears throat> what are the sources <clears throat> sorry, of our evolution. So we looked at microbial source tracking markers. And uh, one of our partners in group in France uh, applied metagenomics to have uh, more insight into the antibiotic resistant genes in particular. So I start with um, the SARS 
Groove 2 monitoring. Um, here the principle is shown. Um, 24 hours composite samples are taken from the wastewater treatment plant influence or from the sewage system in general. Then the biomarkers are enriched, the nucleic acids are extracted, and then after reverse transcriptase quantitative PCR can be done. And then we can see the trends in the infection um, rates, if it's increasing or decreasing, or we can have a look if we have in particular high numbers in specific um, parts of the community. Um, <clears throat> and this is the more detailed method um, illustrated here for the method we are applying in our institute. So the wastewater samples are taken from the influent of the treatment plant here in Karlsruhe. Then we do a centrifugation to separate the solids, followed by polyethylene glycol flocculation. Then the extraction is done automatically. And then we do a one-step digital droplet PCR, focusing on three different genes that we have reliable data. So we should see the similar trends for the different genes. And so we can follow the trends um, in terms of the copy numbers of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acids. The results are then reported and are shown uh, for, yeah, on the homepage of our municipality here in Karlsruhe. So everyone can have a look. And the data also are collected for whole Germany and uh, then can be, um, are shown also at the home page. And you can see the curve here. We started early um, already in the summer of 2020. So we have a very long uh, curve. You can see it here. The wastewater data are shown in blue and uh, seven days incidence from individual testing in red. Uh, and so you can see over time, a good correlation of the trends yeah, of the data. And um, since nowadays, um, most people do not use any individual testing anymore. So we do not have data. Uh, the red curve stops uh, one year ago, uh, but you can see from the wastewater monitoring in blue that uh, we had again, a higher infection uh, during winter time. Then it was decreasing and at present, um, yeah, it's a little bit increasing again. And we know that um, yeah, many people are, are still have infections due, due to corona. But this illustrates that wastewater monitoring is very useful to follow infection trends in the population. And uh, nowadays it's accepted and uh, it's also considered for other pathogens to follow the infection trends by using wastewater-based epidemiology yeah, as a monitoring tool. Um, here are some data from our colleagues in Barcelona. Um, looks very similar. Here you also can see the different uh, variants uh, during the pandemic. Uh, again, we have a good correlation of the data in the wastewater monitoring and the data by individual tasting. Uh, it's similar in Spain, uh, cases reports uh, ended then, and now um, yeah, we rely on the wastewater monitoring. You can also see that the ratio of um, individual testing results and uh, wastewater gene copies are varying yeah, uh, during the pandemic uh, due to the different variants that occur. So it's very difficult to calculate absolute numbers from wastewater monitoring but what you can clearly see are the trends and therefore it's very useful to do this monitoring. Um, our colleagues in uh, Spain, they also have taken samples from uh, surface water. We also have done it here in Germany. Uh, usually we do not see any uh, gene copies of SARS-CoV-2 in surface water. But during some sampling, they did find uh, some gene copies but uh, not very often. Um, and it's very important to note that uh, this is only, um, these are only the nucleic acids, these are not infectious coronaviruses. Yeah? So we still can still see the nucleic acids as a markers, but um, it's not a 
uh, infection uh, transmission due to wastewater or surface water. Okay, then I come to the part of method harmonization. Um, in the beginning of the project, we discussed uh, the different methods and then we agreed to use uh, cultivation methods for E. coli, ESBL producing E. coli, somatic coliphages, F-specific coliphages. Uh, these are standardized already and we agreed on specific methods for the isolation, extraction of bacterial DNA and viral DNA and RNA. So all the partners do this extraction and in the next step, the nucleic acids can be sent to the specific partner laboratories that are specialized in the specific parameters. And there, um, the parameters listed in green, uh, adenoviruses, noroviruses, hepatitis, enteroviruses, microbial source tracking markers, antibiotic resistant genes and metagenomics are done. And it is easy to exchange the nucleic acids. It also can be stored. And so we really have comparable data. The analysis and the responsibilities are uh, illustrated here. So you can see that all the partners are doing the cultivation test and the sampling and extraction. And then we have the specific laboratories that do the analysis of the specific parameters for all the samples from the different partners and countries. The uh, methods are shown here, cultivation methods according to standardized um, procedures and the processing of the samples for subsequent PCR analysis is done by um, the kits that are listed here. And then we can do the storage and the shipment of the nucleic acids and then the specific analysis. Um, we have summarized these methods uh, in the booklet um, on the harmonized method. This is also available on our project website. So if you're interested, you can download um, this booklet on, yeah, from our homepage. Uh, you can have the access here, it's given. Um, and so um, I think this is a good start if you think about harmonization of methods. You can probably um, yeah, benefit from the experiences we have in our project. Um, in the beginning, it was also very important to do a training of our partners from Africa because the labs and the procedures were not um, established um, in the beginning. So we had uh, several visits. Uh, we did the training uh, together with our partners from Uganda here in our institute and also our colleagues from Portugal uh, were in contact with the colleagues from uh, Mozambique. And so we could establish the laboratories and the extraction methods. Um, this must take more time than we expected in the beginning. So it's not so easy to, to purchase these um, instruments in Africa. And it's also not so easy to, <clears throat> to get the consumables. So this might be something you have to consider if you want to do analysis in that region. But uh, we managed to do that. And so we also have some data from Uganda and Mozambique. So I start with some uh, data for the viruses. Um, this is an example for the data uh, for the Targos River catchment in Portugal. So you can see <clears throat> the data for uh, total coliform bacteria for compression purposes and E. coli, and then somatic bacteriophages and F-specific bacteriophages as indicator uh, viruses. And, and samples were taken from the wastewater treatment plant influent, secondary effluent, effluent, and the surface water upstream and downstream. Uh, so you can see that yeah, um, all these parameters are available, but you can see immediately um, that the somatic phages are um, detected in much higher numbers uh, as compared to the F-specific bacteriophages. So if you think about the general indicator, somatic phages uh, might be more suitable because you have higher numbers and you will see them um, earlier if there's uh, some contamination. Um, the next 
slide shows the same data on the left I just have shown, and then the pathogenic viruses detected by quantitative PCR uh, for adenovirus, enterovirus, and noroviruses. You can see that all these pathogens are detected um, in the samples. Um, this is what we expect for the wastewater, but they also are, can be detected in the surface waters. Um, so um, all of them um, have been detected, but we do not see a clear correlation with the uh, indicator viruses, the bacterial phages. Yeah, so if you're interested in pathogens, uh, you always um, have to check them, but you can have um, yeah, a first um, idea if you might have a contamination by using the indicator viruses. Um, some data from our colleagues in Sweden, the Swedish Food Agency, they are specialists for norovirus uh, detection, and they have done the genotyping. Um, here, samples are compared uh, for Sweden, Germany, and France, and the results were quite similar. Um, the same genotypes uh, for genotype one and two were detected um, in these samples from Europe. Um, but what was uh, very obvious is that we have a different genotype if we look at the samples from Uganda shown here. Yeah, here we have a, a for genotype 213, we have a lot of uh, viruses belonging to this genotype. This was dominant um, in the samples from Uganda and it was almost not observed in the European samples. So you can see really have a difference um, according to the region where you do the sampling. And uh, yeah, this was quite obvious for the samples from Uganda, very interesting. So then I continue showing some data for antimicrobial resistance. Um, here we have uh, done the analysis um, for the ESBL uh, bacteria. Um, extended spectrum beta lactamase producing bacteria. Uh, this method, what we usually apply, is um, comparable to the method that is also used for clinical analysis. This means we have um, a medium with um, a high amount of organic compounds, so for eutrophic bacteria. Uh, I come back later to this point. And we also looked at antibiotic resistant genes. Uh, by performing quantitative real-time PCR and looking at the metagenome sequencing. Um, we have taken samples from the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, this is an example for the German wastewater treatment plant, where we have taken samples from the influent and the effluent, and then we have taken samples from the receiving water, the river Alp, um, upstream and downstream. And then we have the larger of our Rhine, where we additionally have taken samples. And the results are then shown here for the wastewater treatment plant influent, effluent, uh, surface water upstream and downstream. And um, you can see, of course, we have higher numbers in the, in the influent. Um, this is similar for all the different uh, sampling areas, so shown here from the left to the right, uh, corresponding to the north, starting with Sweden to the south, Mozambique. Uh, a lot of data, um, and there are, uh, of course, differences in the um, prevalence and relative abundance. I will show you more data in the next slides, Yeah, more comprehensive data. Um, in the beginning, we also had to select some uh, key antibiotic resistance genes for the monitoring because uh, there's, of course, a very, very large number of different uh, genes. So we have uh, done some uh, first analysis, uh, also middle jumping analysis. Then we looked um, at the occurrence of the different genes and different samples, and then we decided to, um, to focus on 
uh, genes um, that are frequently detected at high concentrations, shown here in red, um, corresponding to sulfonamide uh, resistance or beta-lactam resistance or tetracycline resistance. Also, we have um, selected some uh, genes that are um, detected at medium concentrations. And we added also the MCO1 gene uh, that um, uh, results in resistance to cholestine. Um, this is some kind of last resort antibiotic with, that usually is not detected, but uh, just to have also um, data for this gene that we hope not to detect in the environment, but we have, then we had some findings. Yeah. Um, in the next um, slide, um, the data are uh, summarized, and this is the relative abundance of antibiotic resistant genes in the different areas. Again, uh, Sweden at the left, then Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, Israel, Uganda, and Mozambique. And uh, here the specific genes are divided by the total number of 16S RNA genes. Yeah, so this is a relative abundance. And uh, so you can compare and what we see um, that um, obviously in Sweden, the relative abundance is low as compared to the other countries. And in particular for Uganda, for example, we have a high abundance of antibiotic resistance genes. Um, so uh, in general, in Sweden, antibiotic resistance genes seem to be um, less critical. And we know that Sweden already started very early, years ago, to um, have restrictions for the use of antibiotics for animal production. Uh, this seems to be a successful strategy because now we see lower um, abundance of antibiotic resistant genes in the aquatic samples from Sweden. And we have a uh, particular high abundance um, in the samples from Uganda where we do not have any restrictions. So you can buy antibiotics as you like. Um, so this um, definitely seems to make a difference. And this was uh, something interested in the beginning. I, I didn't expect that because I thought antibiotics might be very expensive to purchase in Uganda, but uh, yeah, we see very high numbers. I would like to show you some data um, for the different treatments. Um, here are shown for Germany, uh, on here on the top, uh, the data for E. coli and ESBL bacteria in the influent and effluent of the wastewater treatment plant, and also data for Uganda. And you can see that the reduction uh, in Germany is uh, much more pronounced. Uh, it's about four to five log uh, decrease. And in Uganda, we have about two to three. Um, we have different um, treatments. And in Germany, the wastewater treatment plant, we start with mechanical part, and then we have two steps biological treatment, and uh, since a few years additionally activated carbon, but I don't think that this is so important. But we have a more um, um, more efficient uh, treatment of the wastewater. Um, in Uganda, there is a wastewater stabilization pond, uh, and the removal is not so efficient. And the difference is even more pronounced if we look at the antibiotic resistance genes that are shown here now in red. Uh, we have uh, four different genes. You can see in Germany, uh, the top row, we have um, a reduction between one and three log. So an average about two log of the genes. So this is less um, efficient as compared to the bacteria, E. coli or ESPL. Yeah, so in general, genes are not so good uh, removed. Um, and now if you compare to the data with uh, Uganda with the wastewater stabilization pond, uh, there we have an increase of some of the genes. Yeah? So the, the numbers in the effluent are higher as compared to the influent. Uh, we assume, assume this is because 
there seems to be a gene transfer um, in the bacteria or growing of the bacteria. And uh, so the um, copy numbers for the genes are, are increasing during this um, yeah, passing the stabilization point. Yeah? So there's a very clear difference and purification, of course, is um, not so efficient then. So um, another question in our project was, um, what is the effect of extreme events? Um, so here are some data from our model area in Germany. Uh, you can see uh, some data during yeah, average uh, conditions uh, and during dry periods with uh, lower numbers for coliforms or E. coli or ESBL or phages. And uh, rain in particular after a dry period can result in uh, higher uh, contamination in the surface water. Uh, it can go up um, to lock um, increase in some cases. This is not always the case, yeah. but um, obviously um, a heavy rain after a longer dry period. This is in particular critical and can result in increasing microbiological contamination. But this occurs not always. So it seems to depend on the specific conditions during that periods, but we observed this um, during some of our sampling um, sampling events. Uh, some data for the metagenomics done by our uh, colleagues in France. Um, so they analyze the samples and you can see a high prevalence generally of multi-drug resistant genes, uh, not so specific, but also specific genes are analyzed. And what you can see, um, there are different patterns depending on the different areas. So the pattern in Sweden is different from the patterns in the other countries such as Germany, Israel, or Portugal shown here. And the uh, more detailed analysis is still going on. Um, our colleagues uh, collected all the samples and then did the metagenomics. And it's a lot of data to be analyzed now and it's still going on. Um, and we will continue with our meeting, uh, sorry, with our project to the end of this year and yeah, some more data analysis will be done. Um, another question with respect to the antibiotic resistances uh, that we see um, in the influent and effluent of the wastewater treatment plants, also in the surface water, um, was how stable are these antibiotic resistances. So we have done some microcosm studies um, to have an idea, and we have taken samples from uh, the river water um, or the river water, and we added um, some... Uh, about 20 liter of river water and one liter of wastewater. And then we looked at the different parameters um, during uh, 10 weeks as shown here at different temperatures, room temperature and low temperature for grade centigrade. Um, and then we looked at the ESPL producing um, bacteria. And additionally, we compared uh, with the oligotrophic um, antibiotic resistant bacteria. This means we applied a new method um, where we um, only had low amount of organic compounds for the bacteria to grow. So this is a better reflecting the conditions in the river water, surface water, because then oligotrophic bacteria can grow and they also can be antibiotic resistant, of course. Um, then also genome sequencing was done and we looked at the uh, abundance of the resistance genes by quantitative uh, PCR and also metagenomic data were, were analyzed. Um, results are shown here. Uh, so we have, um, here the results are shown for E. coli, for ESPL E. coli by the conventional method or by 
bottom gene copies. And you can see there is a, a fast decay of E. coli, also of ESBL E. coli, um, within a few days and weeks. Um, the results are decreasing. Yeah, so uh, the bacteria are inactivated, they die off. And so we have a rapid decay of these bacteria. Uh, what is a good result. Um, however, um, we also should look at the bacteria that are in the environment and are growing uh, under oligotrophic conditions uh, that are more representing uh, the conditions in the surface waters. And here we have uh, a very low decay. So these results are more stable. So you can see here the ESBA oligotrophic bacteria um, done on um, R2A plates yeah, for, for low carbon availability. And also the genes are more stable um, so this means um, the antibiotic resistant environmental, this means oligotrophic bacteria are more stable than the ESPL E. coli that are yeah, conventionally analyzed with the method. And so we have a reservoir of antibiotic resistances in the environment and um, yeah, and this is more stable than, yeah, this has to be considered, of course. Yeah. Um, some more results from the sequencing of the oligotrophic ESPL bacteria done by our colleagues in France. Um, so we have um, identification of the bacteria done by the Malditov method. Um, and you can see that different um, antibiotic resistant genes were detected. And uh, due to the analysis, um, it could be concluded that um, the viral context uh, seemed to be important uh, for the transfer um, of the genes. Yeah? So, so viruses are um, yeah, important for horizontal gene transfer. And more analysis is going on to better understand uh, these results. Yeah? So but this is an indication showing that um, viruses are important for the transfer. It's also known from the literature, but um, yeah, this um, confirms the results and yeah, gives more evidence. I'm coming to the work package microbial source tracking. We have a group with a very um, strong experience uh, for these parameters, our colleagues in Barcelona that are in charge for this uh, work package. Um, uh, usually, um, if we detect E. coli in a, in a sample, we know that we have um, some fecal contamination, but we do not know uh, what is the source of this fecal contamination. Yeah? So in this illustration, it could be possible it's coming from human uh, pollution or from pig farming or from wildlife. And uh, so it's very good that we have a parameter showing the uh, pollution in general, fecal pollution, but it would be very helpful to understand uh, the source of the pollution in order to have management options. And if you look for additional parameters such as bacteroides bacteria that are more specific for the specific um, hosts, or also mitochondrial markers can be used. Um, then you can analyze um, what is the source of the fecal pollution. And we were interested um, to understand um, if we can apply the different um, methods that are available for detecting human uh, sources as pollution. Um, this is the Bacteroides human specific marker or Bifidobacterium marker or Bacteroides phage human specific marker. Um, and the question is if all these markers uh, can be used or if there are differences according to the uh, different areas where they are applied. And so we have uh, sent the nucleic acid extracts from 
all the different partners, to our colleagues in Barcelona. And uh, they did the analysis here. Some data are shown uh, again in the raw wastewater, the effluent, the river upstream and downstream. Um, or samples from France, Germany, Israel, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, and Uganda. You can see that the different um, human markers are detected, uh, here shown for crassphage and bifidobacterial markers, um, were detected at all the model sites, and then statistical analysis was done uh, to compare the different data. Um, and you can see that um, all these markers uh, showed a good correlation. Yeah? So this means you can apply different methods um, to look for human pollution. Um, and it's not there's no risk that you probably, if you have a sample from Uganda, theoretically, um, there might be a, a change um, of, of your marker and it will not work, but um, it was confirmed that you can um, use this methods also in the samples from Africa, in this case, Uganda. Um, this was the, analyzed because these methods were developed predominantly in Europe and the United States and Australia. And so we did not have much information about applicability in, uh, in Africa. So um, another question, um, do we have um, also these parameters, can they be detected in uh, bivalves and muscles? Um, could we use um, this uh, BMS um, as an integrating tool to take a sample and then uh, detect if we have, um, as shown here, coliforms E. coli or antibiotic resistant um, gram-negative bacteria? And we had some detections uh, very low numbers, but uh, yeah, for some samples, we could detect them. And this could be an additional strategy for monitoring antibiotic resistances, um, additionally to grab samples. Uh, if you take grab samples, it will depend uh, if you at that moment have a pollution or not. And um, these uh, bivalves and also sediments, I have not shown the data for sediments, but it's similar. You also can use um, sediment data as a kind of uh, time integration. Yeah? And uh, this can be helpful. Um, a more detailed analysis here for some um, mussels from our rivers here in Germany. Um, and uh, in particular, ZOL1 was detected. This is detected very often. Um, and this is the same for this type of uh, sampling. Yeah, and this can, um, yeah, this could be an additional parameter that can be used if you want to understand if uh, specific genes are um, occurring in your area. Okay, um, then I come to the conclusions. So what we have um, seen so far, wastewater-based epidemiology is a new and useful tool for pathogens monitoring developed during the corona pandemic, but uh, it's also useful for other parameters. Um, harmonized methods um, of key uh, edges and antiviral bacteria are a good basis for comparison of surveillance data and our uh, methods are available on our project uh, website. Um, wastewater treatment plant effluents are important sources for antibiotic resistances, yeah. um, resulting to the spread in the aquatic environment. We did find um, higher um, numbers in Uganda as compared to Europe, and in particular in Sweden, we did find low numbers because we think because it was um, antibiotic use was restricted already many years ago. Um, during the wastewater treatment, we see that um, the bacteria, the ESBL bacteria are much better removed than the resistant genes. Um, there are differences of several block. Yeah. Um, the human associated antibiotic bacteria and 
also the genes die off in the aquatic environments. We have seen this in the microcosm studies, but we have more persistent um, antibiotic resistances um, due to the oligotrophic environmental bacteria that persist for a long time. So we have a reservoir in the aquatic environment. The microbial source tracking markers, the human markers that we um, investigated um, are suitable uh, in Europe and also in Africa. Um, and the influence of human fecal contamination was shown in all the model areas by using microbial source tracking. We also can see uh, antibiotic resistance in bioworths and muscles and sediment. And extreme events can lead to increased microbiological contamination. Um, I would like to show you additionally that um, in particular in Africa, uh, we still have not a very high awareness for the antibiotic resistances um, that um, there's a spreading. And um, so our colleagues from Uganda prepared some uh, videos um, that um, to help to have a higher awareness in the public. So if you're interested, you also can find these videos on our project um, web page. And at the end, I would like to thank um, my colleagues um, for very good cooperation. So um, I just listed the um, leading um, colleagues here as a contact person, of course, um, many more are involved. Um, I have seen that my colleague, um, Abed, Professor Abed Nasser from Israel also is attending our meeting. So yeah, so he also can help to answer some questions as a specialist uh, for viruses. Um, so yeah, thank you very much uh, for attending this meeting. Uh, special thanks to the funding agencies. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, we are very thankful that we can do this research. And then I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting and very important uh, issue. I would like to open um, the discussion. If anyone have any question, please raise your hand. I just suggest also to open um, uh, the camera, so it will be uh, much nicer to talk. I'm going to stop the uh, the recording right now, so it's okay to to open uh, 